me? Can you hear me? Am I? Is the sound on? It's on. I think so. Yeah, you're good. And the lights are out. Okay. We're gonna. It's gonna take us just a minute because our lights are going out. Our sound's not on. I think. It, do you have it stopped?
No, there is not. There is no temple. There are other things on the Temple Mount. There is actually two Muslim mosques on the Temple Mount. There's the Dome of the Rock, and there's the Al-Aqsa, probably saying that wrong, mosque. And so the, they both take up the space of the Temple Mount. Now, the Temple Mount is extremely historical to Jews, Christians, and Islam. So we need to understand a little bit about it. The Temple Mount's located on Mount Moriah, and several things have happened over the years on the Temple Mount. For instance, Abraham was told to sacrifice Isaac on the Temple Mount, same location. David bought the threshing floor from Arona, and that was the Temple Mount. That was on the Temple Mount. 957 BC, the first temple was built on the Temple Mount by King Solomon. And then that was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC. And so then there wasn't a temple for a while. And then in 516 BC, so we're going down in time, you know, progressing along 516 BC, Zerubbabel got a group of Jews together and they built the second temple. Now Herod added on to that temple, so it's also known as Herod's temple. When you hear Zerubbabel's temple and Herod's temple, it's not multiple temples, it's one. Same temple, there's only been two. There was the first one by Solomon and the second one by Zerubbabel. And that was the temple that was standing when Jesus was walking on the earth. And then that second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Now, since 70 AD, up until present day, there's been no temple on the Temple Mount. So almost 2,000 years, 1,950 years, there's been no temple on the Temple Mount. And the Jews have been waiting to rebuild that temple. Now, 692 AD, that's when this Dome of the Rock in the center was built, a Muslim mosque. And um, it pretty much occupies either the area where the temple was or very close to it on the Temple Mount, dead center on there. 1967, after the Sixth Day War, although Israel maintains control of the Temple Mount, in an attempt to maintain the status quo, the administration of the Temple Mount was actually handed over to Muslim waif under Jordanian custodianship. So the police that are walking around the Temple Mount are Muslims. There's also Israeli police on the Temple Mount and they're just constantly there trying to keep everybody playing nice, okay? But because it's under Muslim control, you cannot take the Bible out to the Temple Mount. You cannot in any way assume a posture of prayer on the Temple Mount. You cannot even look up. I mean, you might put your hands together and look up. Nope, that could be a posture of prayer. You can't call it the Temple Mount because that's Jewish. You have to call it the Haram al-Sharif. That's the... Muslim name. So basically, you can walk around and just kind of be quiet, and you can at least go up on the Temple Mount. Now, Muslims, realizing that, hearing that, do you think Muslims are ever going to allow the Jews to build a temple on the Temple Mount? Some are saying yes, some are saying no. The Muslims are never going to want the Jews, right? They're never going to want them to build. But, according to scripture, there will be a temple on the Temple Mount. We had just read about it, okay? So we know that by the middle of the tribulation, there has to be, actually, before the middle of the tribulation, there has to be a temple on the Temple Mount because they're sacrificing again. So there has to be. Now, it may be the peace agreement that the Antichrist establishes with Israel that allows the Jews to build the third temple. Really not sure, but it appears to that. The Jews are totally ready for that opportunity to build that next temple. There's an organization called the Temple Institute, and they have absolutely everything they need. They have all the utensils, they have all the building material, and they are ready to go today. They even have the priests all the way down to the robes ready to go. They're practicing sacrifices so that they know how to do it, they're practicing everything. So the temple they're expecting to build, if you go in the Old Testament, you look at Ezekiel 40 through 48, a nauseating detail on all the little dimensions of the temple, that's the one that the Jews are expecting to build on the Temple Mount. 
all they're waiting for is to go ahead to do it. Now, one question we have to ask is, will there be a fourth temple? We know there's going to be a temple, a third temple, during the tribulation. Will there be a fourth temple during the millennium? Or will there be the third temple and that will be the temple during the millennium? We don't know. It would have to be cleansed, but we don't know. So we know from Revelation 11, 1 that we just read that there will be a temple. We also know the Antichrist will go into the temple and declare himself to be God. Here's what I want, what you need to hear. I just said, we know that the Antichrist is going to go into the temple, declare himself to be God. Guess what? We don't know that from Revelation. We know that from other passages. So for instance, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4 says, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it, meaning the second coming of Jesus, will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, which is the Antichrist. I'm saying that it's not in the scriptures. Who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So during the second half of the tribulation, well, at the midpoint, the Antichrist is going to go into the temple and declare himself to be God. So there has to be a temple, right? But it's not in Revelation that we're reading that. And, I, and I'll go into that in a little more detail in a bit. But we have to understand that in times prophecy, to get the entire picture of all of this stuff, of the tribulation, it's scattered throughout Scripture. It's not just in Revelation. There's a bunch in Revelation. There's a bunch in Daniel. But it's other places too, which is why we're studying, looking at all these different passages. So let's look at this again. Now, here's something else to be aware of. And if you want more information on what I'm about to say, Jim King is your guy. He's studied this to death. We need to be aware that there are groups that really want to believe all of Revelation is symbolic or that it was already fulfilled before the Second Temple was destroyed in AD 70. They would much rather think that these judgments are symbolic rather than future. And I can understand why. So, but the problem is they try to spin things to make it fit scripture. So, even though John was clearly told by Jesus that it was future, remember Revelation 119? Jesus said, write the things which will take place after these things. And we know when John was on the island of Patmos in 1895, so we know it's future. But they'll take the argument that it's past fulfillment because there had to be, if John's being told to measure a temple, well then there had to be a temple at the time he was told this. So then John really wasn't being told this in 1895. It had to be before 8070. That's the logic they're trying to use to say it's past. This is all past. This has all already happened. Remember, we've talked about this. There's nothing on the stuff that we're seeing, these judgments, that has happened in history. So it can't be past. But it feels a lot better to say it's past, not still coming. So that, that's interesting. There's different groups, different thought, schools of thought. And if, if you're curious, talk to Jim. He's, he's done lots of study on that. So looking back at verse 2, am I in the right place? Yes, I am. Looking back at verse 2, John is told to do what and why? He's told to measure the temple itself, right, and to leave out the outer court. Note that the fact that he's measuring means that there has to be a real temple. It's not symbolic or that there's going to be a real temple. It also means that God has already designated the exact dimensions of this temple. He's not measuring the outer court because it's been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot for 42 months. How long is 42 months? Hmm? Three and a half years. It's three and a half years. So maybe the reference to the nations is the Muslims and their mosques on the Temple Mount. Notice we've given a time sequence here. We've given 42 months, three and a half years. Many commentaries will try to spiritualize this time period. But the problem with that is when we see exact time sequences with this kind of detail, 
It should be considered literal unless there's something to indicate that it's symbolic, and there's nothing here to indicate that it's symbolic. Now, during the first half of the tribulation, the Jews will be allowed to offer sacrifices. But during the second half, at the midpoint, the Antichrist is going to stop them. Do we know this out of Revelation? No. We know this out of Daniel and out of Matthew, Daniel 9, 27. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Remember, we talked about the one week is seven years. But in the middle of the week, in the midpoint of the seven-year period, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offerings. So Daniel told us this, and then Jesus told us in Matthew 24, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Because he's going to persecute the Jews. He's going to stop the sacrifices, and he's going to persecute the Jews. So, I, I want to just give you a mindset here when we're talking about all these end times prophecy. And I was trying to come up with a, a visual, but I don't have a visual. So bear with me. Does everybody here remember the projectors and you'd have transparencies and you'd put it on the projector and it would be? Okay. So if we have a transparency that has a part of a picture on it, okay, and then I put another transparency on top of it that has a part of a picture on it, we're going to see like both parts of that, right? And then if I put another transparency that has another part of the picture, we're going to see that too. We're going to see all three of them. This is a way we can think of end times prophecy. So we've got some end times prophecy in Revelation. We've got some end times prophecy in Daniel. We've got some in 2 Thessalonians. We've got some in Matthew. The end times prophecy is scattered throughout several books of the Bible. And what we have to do is we have to take all of it and put it together so that we see the full information that God is giving us. So that's why we go to Daniel, we go to Matthew, and we see, oh, there's a firm covenant, and it's for one week. It's Daniel that tells us that. It's not Revelation that tells us that. This is why Revelation is hard. We have to know where the, this end times prophecy is, and if you have a study Bible, it gives you references of where to go, and you pull this together, and you stack it on top of each other, and then you can do time charts and see, okay, when we get to the middle of the tribulation, I'm expecting this. And I'm going to get it out of this book. That's how we piece all of this together. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's kind of what we're doing here when we're looking at these different passages. Now, when the temple is built, it will pave the way for the fulfillment of several end times prophecies. So we, we already talked about this, but we saw in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, Paul told us the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God and declare himself to be God. Jesus told us in Matthew 24, a lot of things in Matthew 24, but in 15 and 16, he says to look for the abomination standing in the holy place. And then Daniel in 9, 11, and 12 tells us the Antichrist will break his covenant with the Jews, bringing sacrifice and offerings to an end in the middle of of the tribulation, okay? So, we see this scattered all around. Now, why should we be watching what's going on related to current events? Because Jesus told us to. Matthew 24, 42, Jesus said, Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. Well, one of the ways we have to be on the alert is to be aware of what's going on. And I'll tell you, my natural tendency with news is I would rather stick my head in the sand and not pay attention to it. But because Jesus is saying be on the alert, I'm going to be on the alert. I'm going to be paying attention. So what do we need to be paying attention to in terms of end times prophecy? Well, I can think of four things. Maybe there are others. But one is we've talked a lot about countries opposing Israel. We want to pay attention to that. We want, to talk, we want to be paying attention to the rise of socialism, globalism, the one world government, and, and that's the direction of socialism and globalism is going. We want to be paying attention to anything about a peace treaty with Israel. Have we seen that this week? We have seen that this week. President Trump unveiled the deal of the century to try to get peace between Israel and Palestine. So we should all know about that. We should be watching that. I don't think that's going to 
Why? Because the Palestinians won't even come to the table. They won't even consider it. So even if the Palestinians do come to the table, in that peace agreement, it says that the Temple Mount will maintain its current status quo. No changes to the Temple Mount. So there's nothing in there that would kind of tip the hand that, that something's going to happen as far as I can see. I don't think anything will happen, but we should be watching for this kind of thing. And then the other thing, anything that involves an, an okay that they can start building, that would be huge. That would be huge. So those are things that we should be keeping our eye on. And with that, let's jump on to verses 3 through 6. I'm in the right place. Okay. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies. So if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. So these are mysterious guys. And so when we get to our small group, one of the questions that we want to ask is, do the two witnesses prophesy during the first half of the tribulation or during the second half of the tribulation? We can figure it out. We can go through scripture and figure it out. So you guys will do that when you get to the small groups. But for now, let's also look at verse 4. Why are they suddenly referred to as olive trees and lampstands? What in the world is that talking about? This is where if you had a study Bible in it, it would say Zechariah 4. Zechariah 4, I think, is 14 verses. And if you go through and read all of Zechariah 4, it would make sense then. The two witnesses in Zechariah 4 were empowered by the Holy Spirit, which was symbolized by olive oil. Likewise, these two witnesses in Revelation 11 will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And they will have supernatural ability to stop rain, turn water to blood, bring plagues. They'll be able to kill anyone who tries to harm them with, their, with the fire coming out of their mouths. And they will prophesy for 1,260 days. How long is that? Three and a half years. They will prophesy for three and a half years. Have we ever seen anything like the fire coming out of their mouth before? Any prophets ever done that? Jim's shaking his head, yes. And yes, there is something like that. Elijah called fire down from heaven. It didn't come out of his mouth. He just said, if I'm a man of God, then let fire come down and wipe you out. And fire did. That was in 2 Kings 1. You see how these people kept going against Elijah and he just kept knocking them out with fire, saying, then let fire come down. So do we know who these two witnesses are? Does Scripture tell us? No. Scripture does not tell us. We can speculate, and there's lots of speculations, but here's the thing I would like to really ask you guys. When you speculate, I think it's so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, would you make note, as you're speculating in your conversations, that we don't know, okay? Because that's how we always make sure we are applying the authority of Scripture. So these are the three most common speculations, first being Moses and Elijah. Why? Well, because Moses turned water to blood, so there's a similar miracle. Elijah destroyed people with fire. Elijah also prayed for no rain, and it didn't rain for three and a half years, same time frame. Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus, or with Jesus, in the transfiguration. Malachi 4 said that the prophet Elijah would appear before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And then you can also think of it as well. Yeah. Moses represents the law, and Elijah could represent the prophets. So, and since this is being focused on the Jews, two big wigs like Moses and Elijah would make sense, you know? But could it be Enoch and Elijah? Because Enoch and Elijah were both raptured, they didn't die. So some people think it's Enoch and, and Elijah. The only problem is that I would see with that is Enoch was a Gentile. And you, so you would think these would be Jews. And then the other school of thought is, we don't know. It's not any known person because they're not identified. And if they were a famous person uh, that, we, uh, that we know from the Bible, would they be identified? Now, it's fine to have the conversation saying, well, I think it's this. 
as long as we follow that up with, but we don't know because scripture doesn't tell us. See, when we do that, if we just say, I think it's this, then we're saying, according to my revelation, it's this. And it's much, much uh, more glorifying to God if we say, I think it's this, but we don't know because scripture doesn't tell us. Then we're pointing back to the authority of scripture as where truth lies. Does that make sense? We always say, I think it's this, but scripture doesn't tell us, so we can't know for sure. Which says, I, I'm not an authority. Scripture's the authority, so we can't know for sure. Okay, so let's go on to 7 through 10. When they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes out, up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their de dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Wow. Okay, so according to verse 7, when are these two witnesses going to be killed? Yes and yes. When they finish their testimony, and they're going to test, they will prophesy for 1260 days, which is three and a half years. So that's what we know so far. And then they are going to be killed, and there's only one person who has the authority to kill them. Who is that? According to verse 7. The beast. There's two beasts. This one says the beast that comes from the abyss. And we haven't heard about the beast who comes from the abyss yet in those terms. We'll learn all about it in Revelation 13 when we get to that. But just a spoiler alert, this is the Antichrist. This is the Antichrist. So where are they killed? Can we tell from the description in verse 8 where they're killed? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Why is it Jerusalem? It's the city where their Lord was crucified. That's Jerusalem. So it's also mystically called Sodom, which means immorality. It's going to be an immoral time. And Egypt, that could mean oppression. It could also mean materialism. So lots going to be happening in Jerusalem at that time. Now, why do people not allow them to be buried? Well, they're celebrating their death by letting their bodies decay in public. That Boy, that shows the depravity of man at this point, doesn't it? But the, and they wanted to disgrace them, you know, disrespect them. That makes sense. And then when they're killed, what kind of stature is this going to give the Antichrist? What would he be considered at that point? A hero. A hero. Yeah, maybe God, since no one else could kill him. But he'll be a tremendous hero, taking out these evil troublemakers who were tormenting people. Here's the interesting point, though. How long must their bodies lie? And why? Why is that time frame important? One and a half days for every year and a half that uh, they live. Oh, okay. Could be. There's another reason that three and a half years is significant. And why, they, why God allowed them to lay there for three and a half years. See, Jewish tradition says that the... Hmm? Did I say that? I'm sorry. It's three and a half days. Sorry, three and a half days. Yeah, just, just correct me if I say it wrong. So Jewish tradition says the spirit doesn't leave the body until the third day. So there's a chance that they could be revived if, you know, if, if, they, if they came back to life in two days. That would make sense to people because the spirit hadn't left the body. But since it's been three and a half Days, there's no way because the spirit's already left the body. So that's why it's three and a half days. And then verse 9 also says the nations will look at their dead bodies. Who's the nations? This could be rep just representatives in Jerusalem from all different nations. 
What else could it be? What do we have now that we wouldn't have had at any other time in history? Television. The ability to have worldwide media coverage. CNN, breaking news, right on these two witnesses, right? And the whole world, all nations can see it. Now, I'm not telling you that's the way it is. Maybe it just means people from all nations were there. But it's interesting, isn't it? That we now have those capability just in this generation. And we haven't had that before. Let's look at verses 11 through 13. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them. And they stood on their feet, and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. Then they went up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And in that hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Hmm. Okay, so, verse 11, what's happening? God raises them up, right? He resurrects them, and they stand alive in front of everyone. Wow. Can you imagine? It says great fear. I think that's an understatement. I mean, three and a, those bodies, you realize those bodies would have been decaying. After three and a half years, they would have been gross. Sorry, three and a half days? Three and a half days. Really would have been gross in three and a half years. Three and a half days. It wouldn't have been good. And then boom, they're alive. Wow. And then what happens in verse 12? After God resurrects them so that all can see that they're alive, everyone sees them raptured. Everyone sees them go up into heaven. Can you imagine what their enemies will think as they watch all of this happen? Well, we'll find out. But one thing I want to just let you know, when we get back to our small groups, we want to ask the question, where are we in the tribulation period at this point? When they're, when they're raptured, where are we in the tribulation period? So we'll, we'll take a look at that. But what happens after, immediately after, in verse 13, after the two witnesses are raptured, what happens? There's a great earthquake. How big of an earthquake? Really severe. It takes out 7,000 people. I don't have any idea what magnitude of an earthquake that would be. But did you know that there is a major fault that goes right through Israel? A major fault. Isn't that ironic? And did you know that the last major earthquake that struck this fault was in 1927? And the one before that was in 1836. So they know that they're due they have, this is called a hundred year fault. They know that they're due for the next major one. And in 2018, it started having tremors. And so they are in an active state of preparing for this next major earthquake. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Now, it could happen, right? A major earthquake could happen that is not anything to do with this earthquake being talked about in Revelation 11. But I still find it interesting that they're due now, and there's a major fault right at this spot. So, now how do the people who survived the earthquake, I'm going the right way, yes. How do the people that survived the earthquake react, according to verse 13, after the two witnesses are resurrected, raptured, and then there's an earthquake? What do they do? Do they repent? What does it say? They're terrified and... They give glory to God. So do they repent? We don't know at this point. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. We'll have to see. This is one that we want to put a question mark on. Does this mean they're repenting? Put a question mark, and let's see what we find out as we study further. We don't know the answer to that yet. Okay? So now, going on to 14 through 17. How are we doing? Okay. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of our Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. 
And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. All right, we have several things to talk about. First, what happens in verse 15? You see the seventh, the seventh trumpet judgment, right? The, the seventh trumpet of the judgment sound. And it says, the kingdom of God is declared. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. So, does that mean the world, that if the world has now become the kingdom of God, that Jesus is returning right here? What do you think? Where's John? John, is Jesus returning here? No, why? And a half more years to go. Yeah. Jesus doesn't return till the end. He doesn't return to the end. So then what does the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our God mean? These are the kinds of things that trip us up in scripture. And when we see this, normally we're not understanding what the verse tense means in the original language. So when we look at the Greek verb tense, we see has become is in the aorist middle tense. And what that means is the action will happen, but we don't know when it will be completed. So the seventh trumpet has blown, which initiates the last set of judgments, which will complete the wrath and usher in the kingdom of God. And then we see you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. I'm sorry, has begun to reign. Aorist, is that what it says? It says has begun to reign. Aorist indicative action. This means the action is going to be completed by the subject, but we don't have a specific time as to when it's going to be completed. See, that's hard for us because in English it would just mean it's happening now, but it doesn't mean that in Greek. So this doesn't mean Jesus is coming now. This is saying Jesus is the victor, but we're not going to see the finale for three and a half years. So something that we could relate to better is if you have repented and believed in Jesus, you know that you're going to be with him when you die. Because he's already paid the price in the past. And so if you've believed in him, you know you're going to be with him when, when you die. But we don't know when that's going to be, do we? We don't know when we're going to die and be with him. So we know it's done. We know the action has already been completed. We just don't know when it's going to be carried out. So that's the way to think about what's going on here. Now, also note in verse 17, and this is only in the word for word. The phrase for phrase and thought for thought translations don't do this. But in the word for word in the New American Standard, notice what it says as describing our Lord God, the Almighty, who are and who were. This is talking about the Trinity. We've just seen further up that it's talking about in verse 15, it's talking about God the Father and Jesus. And now we see who are and who were. So the 24 elders fell on their faces and worshiped God the Father and Jesus. We saw this back in Revelation 5 also. We saw the 24 elders falling down worshiping Jesus. We see this again. This is not the only place that we see this, but that's kind of cool. And I said that's only in the word for word translation. I had to go look in the phrase for phrase and thought for thought to see if they did that. Now, Let's look at verses 18, and we're almost done. Look at verses 18 and 19. But before we read it, I want to set this up, because this is Jewish thought, and this confuses us. We've talked a little bit about Jewish thought before and the differences. We think in Western thought. We think chronologically. Things should happen in order. But Jewish thought, I've described it as an intermission. I've described it as Jewish thought as, oh, here's another thing I forgot to tell you that I'm going to interrupt the action and tell you right now. Remember that? We've kind of talked about that. Well, the way the Jewish thought is working here is it's an overview. And then the details are going to come later. We see this multiple times throughout Scripture. We see it in Genesis. So in Genesis 1, we see the six days of creation. And then Genesis 2, starting in verse 4, we find out more detail about the six days of creation in Genesis 1. Same thing is happening here. This is an overview of what is coming in the next three and a half years. 
And so now that we understand that, let's read it and we'll pick that apart. Yeah, I've got that up there, right? Yeah, Revelation 11, 18 and 19. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, and sounds, and peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. Okay, so the nations were enraged. That makes perfect sense. Their heart was not repentant, but angry, and they were angry about God's wrath on them, right? And then it says, your wrath came, past tense. Well, it's because it's talking about the future. It's an overview. I, I didn't look up the verb tense on this one, but again, we're saying the wrath came. Now, all the wrath isn't done yet, right? Seventh trumpet is blown, and that's initiating the six bowls but they haven't happened yet at this point, so there's still wrath to come. And we won't see the six bowls until Revelation 16. And then it says, time came for the dead to be judged. There's our real clue. The time came for the dead to be judged. That's not happening yet. We still have all the bowl judgments to go. That judgment's gonna happen at the end of the tribulation, right? So therefore we know this is an overview of what's still to come. It says the time came to give rewards to the bond servants, prophets, and saints. Did you know that there's rewards for us? It's kind of cool, isn't it? But that's not now, that's later. It says the great and small will be judged. Again, that's the future. He will destroy those who destroy the earth. Not going to happen yet, that's future. So with the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the victory is Christ, right? It's just going to take three and a half years before the action is completed. But the last of the, tr of the judgments has been kicked off with the seventh trumpet. Now, it also says that the temple of God in heaven is opened and the ark appears. So what's the significance of the ark? Well, Hebrews 8 tells us the temple on earth is a copy of the temple in heaven. So we don't know... What we don't know is who will see this when the when the when God opens up the temple in heaven and the ark appears. Who's going to see that? I don't know. I don't know. But what does the ark of the covenant represent? Well, it's where God dwells with His people. The ark is where the holy of, was in the holy of holies, in the tabernacle, and in the temple. And the high priest could go into the holy of holies. How often? Once a year, once a year, and he would sprinkle blood over the four corners of the lid, which is called the mercy seat, and the two cherubim over the top of it. And when Jesus made propitiation for our sins, that's a word that I always have a hard time saying, propitiation. The word, the word propitiation is actually mercy seat. So the blood of animals was sprinkled on the corners of the mercy seat, Trusting that God would take away the sins of the world. But it wasn't the blood of animals that actually took away sin. It's only the true sacrifice, Jesus' blood. And we're told that in Hebrews 10, that no animal blood ever took away sins. It was trusting that God was going to take away the sins. So as we enter the second part of the tribulation, which is called the Great Tribulation, we're going to see horrible disasters. We are going to see all hell break loose on earth. But what we want to keep our eyes focused on is the fact that the victory has already been won by Jesus. So we can rest in knowing Jesus is the victor in the midst of all the bad stuff. He's going to reign, and Satan doesn't have a chance. And so for those who've repented of sin and committed it to Jesus as their Lord and their Savior, we're going to share in that victory. We have that victory to look forward to. And he will strengthen us for whatever we have to go through before then. Now, as we continue to read what's coming, with, we can read it with the confidence that Jesus has already rescued us from the wrath to come, right? So now, let's go back to our small groups, and we're going to focus on two things. We're going to focus on the two witnesses. When do they prophecy? First half, second half, and right here at this point, what part of the tribulation are we in? Okay? All right, remember, if you need any handouts from last 
from previous weeks that are on the table, and as in your small groups, I'm going to put them away. So make a make a um, trip back to that table before you jump into your small groups.